Welcome back to another episode of The Unlockable Podcast. Today, Hannah and I will have our first ever guest on the show, an awesome guy named Danny from Lontana Games. We're going to be talking about what it takes to be an indie developer in a world filled with so much competition. We'll discuss the behind the scenes of game developing, and then we're going to take a look at what Lontana has on the market. So let's get started. Welcome back to Bird Dog Gaming. I'm your host, Christian, and joining me as always is Hannah. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. And today we will be joined by CEO of Lontana Games. Danny, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, y'all. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. Doing great over here. How's that Boston weather treating you? It's cold. (laughs) It's really, really cold. Uh, I have uh, never traveled up to the north, uh, northeast at least. I would love to, though. I want to go to New York. Uh, where are you guys? Hannah's in Florida. I'm down here in Houston, Texas. Lucky. Yeah. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I wouldn't say that. It's hot I don't know. down I, here. I would I would gladly take Florida weather over Boston weather right now. Really? Oh, yeah. It's about, let's see. So it hit about 20 last night, um, if not colder. It's about 30 today. It's supposed to go up to 60 on Tuesday, but then, like, back down into the teens. Look at us on a gaming podcast talking about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about you, Danny, and what you do at Lontana Games. All right, so I'm Danny Silvers. I am a CEO and game designer for Lontana Games. We are a very small indie studio up in Boston, Massachusetts. Beautiful Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> um uh, so we have uh, been working on web and PC games since 2009. Uh, our last launch was Mondrian Abstraction and Beauty in 2015, and we are following that up this year with Mondrian Plastic Reality. Very um, exciting. Yep. Yeah, uh, so it's the sequel. Um, it introduces uh, five playable characters, a time-tripping adventure mode, uh, a s- uh, semi-customizable museum, which is uh, the hub world for the game, and uh, a simple but powerful level editor called Mondrian Maker, which we've been using to make all the levels in the game uh, from the very beginning. And uh, that is going to be available to everybody who buys the game. And it's super easy to get a level up and running. Uh, It takes seconds to make a level and minutes to make it perfect. So uh, we're we're really excited about where that's going in particular. Uh, And we're super duper excited to build a creator community around that. Uh, so in order to make that happen, we, first of all, will be implementing uh, Steam Workshop compatibility, but we're also uh, the first game up on uh, this uh, fairly new website, mod.io, uh, that was not part of the site's initial press announcement. And that's made by uh, my friends over at Debolical, who were also responsible for IndieDB and ModDB. Okay. And uh, so this new website is basically like Steam Workshop without the Steam requirement. Gotcha. Uh, so so uh, you can access it from anywhere, whether PC or mobile. Uh, and they've got, you know... API backend integration that we're going to be trying to get into the game at some point. Uh, But in the meantime, you can just like any creation you make, you can zip up and upload to the site. Very cool. Yeah. So our goal is to get a uh, creator community going that uh, really supports each other uh, and in turn supports the studio. Uh, And we will be supporting patronage on uploaded content. So if you like want to donate a dollar, ten dollars, or a hundred dollars to your favorite creator, um, that creator will get the vast majority of revenue on that uh, eighty twenty split. We are all for supporting indie developers out here on the Unlockable Podcast. Yes, we are. I should hope so. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you, there is no support for 
or like not no, but there's very little uh, external support for indies. We make our money off the fans. So speaking of money, let's talk about the impact of G two A on your company and. Um... Mm. Yeah, let's just talk about how you avoid devaluing your games in a market that practically forces you to give them away for free. So, for anybody unfamiliar, G2A uh, and similar sites like Kingwin are referred to uh, as gray market sites. And what these gray market sites are is when developers sell their games in bundles or uh, they sell keys on their own websites what will happen is a lot of users on these websites will use stolen credit cards to buy these keys oh wow um illegally um so then you get hit, not only do you then get hit with credit card chargebacks the people who've essentially stolen the keys then sell them for profit <laughs> so what ends up happening is you get this ecosystem of fake keys, uh, essentially fake keys, and developers do have control over canceling keys, but we have seen instances uh, where developers will tend to overcorrect on uh, on on these things. So uh, I think Ubisoft overcorrected a little bit and like canceled all keys for a game that was in a bundle a while back and there were people who had still bought the bundle legitimately so right. then they had to you know re-correct and reverse course on that a little bit um so there is not a great solution in that area but essentially if you're buying a key off of a gray market site and it looks you know the the price looks too good to be true there's a very high chance that the price is too good to be true and you're not supporting the developer at all. You are instead buying a stolen key, I would say a good 40 to 50% of the time. It is just awful. It is awful. Um, there are instances where you know people will get their keys in a bundle legitimately um, and then go and sell them on the gray market. That's not quite as bad, but the other issue to keep in mind is that when you buy a bundle, uh, developers are getting maybe a couple pennies uh, from that bundle, depending on the price. So, you know, if, especially if it's like a pay what you want bundle, most people will pay a dollar, and that bundle will include maybe five games. So the bundle management uh organization you know say it's like uh groupies or indie bundle or humble bundle or whoever mm -hmm. uh will have to they they take their cut which is usually like you know between 50 and 70 percent of the bundle cost mm -hmm. then the developers split the rest usually evenly sometimes some developers take slightly more than others depending on like the size of the game in there and like the clout uh, that comes with them being in it um, so at that point with only like 30 cents left to go around between say like 5 or 6 developers each developer is only making maybe 7 or 8 cents per bundle at the very most and then anybody who then doesn't want the keys for that specific game goes on to G2A and sells it for four bucks. Wow, I had no idea that that kind of a market was out there. Yeah, neither did I. This is the first time I'm ever hearing of this. Oh, it's, ba it's bad. I mean, neither of us are PC gamers, so I guess that would be the reason, but I've, I've never even heard of... That's crazy. It's, it's bad. Um, people aren't talking about it as much now as they were a few years ago. I do know that... Um, a lot of these sites have been trying to get developers on board to sell their games directly through the site to avoid this happening or to I don't know if they've put anything in place to um, say no we don't want our games sold at all on here you're not allowed to um, which would be the uh, the route that I would prefer to take right but, um, 
Yeah, basically their reputation is so tarnished because of this kind of activity that, um, I don't know, I personally would never want to work with a site like that. No, I don't blame you. You guys are, the indie developers seem to be treated similar to music artists in this day and age. I mean, from what I understand, they are making pennies on the dollar for songs that are being downloaded, if that. Um I mean, with Spotify and Apple Music, you pay like five, ten bucks a month tops, and you get unlimited music. Um, people don't buy physical media anymore. <laughs> I, from what I understand, artists are not getting paid from their music these days. Like, you can get money from merch, you can get money from concerts, but yeah, it's it sounds like it's very similar for the indie community trying to make money out here. Well, that's why my recommendation to anybody going indie uh, is to kind of follow the same model that musicians do. You do, in fact, have to merchandise. Uh, you have to have t-shirts. You have to have buttons. You have to have um, like limited physical editions of your games on uh, whatever medium you think is going to do best. These days, uh, it's like you know, you could sometimes, you know, put them on CD or DVD. Um, even still, uh, you could put them on USB drive. You could put them on SD card. Um, there isn't really a great solution to that that's cheap. Uh, at the very least, you know, if you get your, your T-shirts and your socks going, um, you can set those up on, like, Redbubble or Streamlabs or wherever. Uh, and you know, hopefully you can make a few pennies uh, passively um, while you're uh, while you're developing your game. Uh, but you know, the the big difference I think between uh, games and music is that musicians, bands at the very least, can go on tour. The closest game developers have to going on tour is conventions, <laughs> and when people go to conventions, they're like the thing I've noticed is that they were not expecting to spend money so like they'll show up to a booth and you know they'll be like oh my god I'd love to buy this game I'll get it when I get home I'm sorry I didn't bring any credit cards (laughs) like really it's a trade show I get it when I get paid right Uh, so it's a it's it's a really weird balance um, between like you know you're running a business, so you got to make money, but you're also, you know, trying to be as nice to your fans as possible, uh, and not like squeeze them for every penny they're worth. So if I'm listening to this and I want to buy a Lantana Games T-shirt, where can I do that? Um, head on to lantanagames.com/shop. That will redirect you right to our Redbubble shop, and we have t-shirts, we have hoodies, we have socks, um, we have a whole lot of good stuff up there. Support your independent game developers, guys. Yes, that is a big message here. (laughs) Yeah. I see on your website you guys work with schools. Can you go into that a little bit? Yes. Um, So one of the um, core tenets of... Lantana Games is that we live to mentor. Uh, We work with colleges like Northeastern University, Savannah College of Art and Design, Becker College, uh, to give uh, students their first opportunities in the games industry. One of the things we noticed a few years ago was that uh, entry-level opportunities are few and far between. And when an opportunity is listed as entry, they still expect you to have five years of experience and knowledge of stuff the schools never teach you. Wow. Um, So, you know, the big question everybody always asks is, if I need experience to start, where do I get that experience? So our answer was right here at Lantana Games. So what we make in terms of our games are... Highly scoped, fairly low budget, but we teach just about everything that you need to know as a developer in order to get your foot in the door at a bigger and better studio. 
essentially. Um, we have had team members who've gone on to great careers at the likes of Harmonix and Riot and uh, I don't know, you you name it. Like we've had we have had our students go on to just like very very successful um, successful careers down the line. It's it's really impressive, and they they do name drop us when they go there and they get to show you know the work they did whether it's uh you know doing like a thousand frames of animation or it's you know programming uh back-end systems to get a level editor working you know we do you know highly scoped and, and low budget games but still pretty ambitious for the size and scale of the team yeah absolutely yeah, I love that y'all do that. I have a question, because I'm genuinely okay. curious. What is the typical day for an indie developer? Is it just eat, sleep, and drink code, or what is it? What do you do? Um, So I kind of follow the John Carmack schedule a little bit. What he likes to do, and that's the um, uh, one of the original creators of Doom, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know, right. he can't work on any one thing for more than like three hours at a time. I think he says three to four. So what I tend to do, uh, at least in my position, is I have like a big list of all these different things I have to get to. You know, a little bit of coding here, a little bit of systems design there, uh, some web work, some blogging, some... Uh, some Instagramming, some you know other marketing, cut together a video, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I tend to do is I've got that all listed out in Trello, of everything I need to do, and each day I will pick like two or three things that I'm going to work on. So I'll say, all right, I'm going to devote four hours to coding, and then I'm going to put four hours into, say, systems design or... Uh, you know, blogging, marketing, etc. And usually within that four hour period, I can knock out another like four or five subtasks of this like overarching genre of task, I guess you could say. Then knowing all that, I can usually get between five and 10 individual tasks done in a day, as well as trying to make time for food and sleep and gym. Um, like, so I don't go out very much. Uh, I only see my girlfriend once or twice a month. You know, I love her to bits. Uh, but work is very, very, uh, stressful, you know? And there's, there's a lot to get done as an indie developer with no budget and a very small team. Uh, you do have to wear a lot of hats. You do have to be ready to fill in uh, on any given area, on any given day. And then sometimes, you know, a wrench will get thrown in there like, oh God, I have to, you know, set up a booth at PAX East. And so you, you know, then you have to do booth design all of a sudden. And you have to start thinking about A, getting the build ready in time, B, making and ordering uh, printed materials for the show. Um, you have to worry about like uh the booth setup so like where's the big tv that runs the trailer gonna be uh where are the laptops that actually have the game on them gonna be what kinds of banners do i need how big a booth have i got has it got uh back drape side drape is it just like a table in the middle of a space with nothing else around it how big is the table uh, what size tablecloth do I need, et cetera, et cetera. So this, yeah, every single day is different. And you just have to kind of be ready to improvise, go with the flow. Uh, you know, every day kind of is what it is. Does and Lantana attend a lot of conventions? We try to, um, particularly local ones, just because travel is so expensive for the most part. Right. So we're not at PAX East this weekend. Which honestly, I'm pretty grateful for what with not just the flu, but also this weird coronavirus mm -hmm. thing going yeah. around. I'm not like the most worried about it because everything I've heard about it mostly just sounds like a small cough and 
maybe, you know, regular flu symptoms at the very worst. I've had plenty of flus in my life. Just, <laughs> you know, quarantine yourself for a week and have lots of chicken noodle soup. <laughs> But, you know, honestly, I'm okay not being at PAX this weekend. I mean, I hear it's pretty good, and there's actually some interesting business deals getting done. Uh, So maybe in that sense I'm missing out. But there's still some opportunities coming up, although GDC just got canceled uh, as of last night. Oh, wow. Um, So this virus is scaring people a little bit. Uh, particularly in games and tech, because so much of games and tech relies on China and people in China mm-hmm. um, that, you know, that's that's where the disease started. Yeah. So nobody really knows, you know, what will be coming through uh, customs for these shows. So, you know, that's it just is what it is. Um, I haven't seen what the the big response is around the game industry to uh, GDC being canceled. I have seen uh, some of my old teammates pretty upset about it just because, you know, a lot of them go to GDC every year. Uh, I personally don't, but some of them do, and they really enjoy it, and I can tell that, like, they're at least pretty upset about it. That would be... So there is that. Yeah, that would be a really big bummer. But... Uh. Yeah, that would suck. I I think the um the worst part though, normally the big exhibitors at GDC um can kind of eat the cost of not going cuz they're big enough that like if they spend $10,000 on a booth, that's whatever to them. An indie will never spend 10,000 on a booth. An indie can maybe spend $5,000 max. And for a city like San Francisco, five thousand dollars is really just travel. So what a lot of indies will do is they'll travel to GDC and you know they'll book a room for the week, uh, but that's their five thousand dollar budget. So they'll spend the rest of the week just at the bars and coffee shops around town with their demo open. That makes sense. So then now, <laughs> so now they they can't do that. Yeah, it's scary. It's it's really scary and. There, there are some options for what they can do in terms of trying to get, you know, some meetings going, um, particularly, you know, on the Internet. Uh, I know that uh, Indie Game Business has an upcoming conference, uh, online conference, that uh, everybody can get in on. And I do recommend it. I've been to it before. It's pretty good. You get some good meetings, get some productive meetings. Uh, but if you were going to GDC to, like, watch the talks and network and just generally have a good time can't really help you there (laughs) okay so if i am inspired and i really want to make a game where should i start should i start with like a concept or a design or like what would be the process that you would recommend um so first of all if you're looking to make a game and you don't know any programmers the first thing you have to do is to learn a little bit of programming. My recommendation there is to pick an engine, preferably a free one, um, and familiarize yourself with some of the concepts of coding. Uh, there are some coding games out there that you can play that don't really teach you how to code in a specific language, but they will get you familiar with the concepts of functions and loops and um, conditions and and the math and and everything else uh, and like drawing to the screen and and everything else that's involved with game development. That's pretty cool. So if you're like a super newbie to game development, coding games are a pretty good place to start. After that, I would say pick up a free engine uh, be it Unity or Unreal or Click Team Fusion free or I think Pico 8 might be free, but, you know, it's only HTML. Um, it's only HTML5 and only on the web, but, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like, whatever you can make a game in in a very short amount of time, like a very small game, short amount of time, uh, do it and get involved in some game jams. Uh, And for anybody not familiar with what a game jam is, a game jam is a very short period of time where you work alone or you work with a small team 
to make a game in usually about a weekend. They can go anywhere from 72 hours to a couple weeks in length. Uh, and in that amount of time, you make a game based on a theme that the jam host gives you. So, uh, like, I've done game jams. Uh, some of my personal favorites were Tiny World, where I made basically a very small and rudimentary SimCity clone in a weekend, but in, like, a uh, 64 by 92 sized window. <laughs> so very, very, very tiny. Um, I've done... Uh, I was part of the first global game jam, which I don't remember what the theme was for that, but we made some, like, magnetic physics game, which was pretty ambitious for uh, the amount of time we had. Uh, and it got pretty stressful. Uh, but Game Jam since then, um, like, your, your first one's going to be very stressful. And over time, you'll figure out the rhythm for it. And it's very good practice at um, team management and working under, you know, a short crunch period and um, just getting something out the door. I remember after I graduated, I was watching a live stream um, back at college, some of my old friends doing the next Global Game Jam. And uh, I was watching this, I was, I was watching the live stream, but so was uh, our my, my old professor, Brenda. And I remember seeing them, it was like 12 hours into the Game Jam and they still hadn't come up with like they they still hadn't agreed upon a concept to make and you know they were like just constantly erasing the whiteboard and trying to come up with something new etc et et and time was a wasting they only had 72 hours to make something and they were down to 60 so brenda calls them up uh and you can hear in the live stream on the speakerphone okay you guys need to make a fucking game <laughs> <laughs> so yeah game jams are high pressure situations but a lot of fun and you get really really um interesting products out of them uh for instance the original mondrian abstraction and beauty that was made um during an itch.io game jam uh devoted to breakout clones um we had breakout cloned in about five minutes uh, you know, the ball was bouncing around and the paddle was moving left and right. And we were like, um, okay, how do we make this interesting? Uh, and I, I don't remember who came up with the idea to make it orbital instead of linear. Uh, but basically by the end of the weekend, everything we know about like the core gameplay of Mondrian today that is still in place was done by the end of that weekend. These game jams sound super interesting. Were you working with strangers for Mondrian? No, that was um, I was working with the team okay. that weekend. Um, but depending on the game jam you go to, uh, you'll either have to work alone, such as um, during Ludum Dare. You'll have to work with strangers, such as at um, uh, Global Game Jam. Uh, or you'll get to work with people you know who like are already on your team. And, you know, it all just kind of depends on what the jam host uh, puts in place for rules. And where do you find these? I mean, are they online? Are they at conventions? There are some at conventions. Um, those tend to be less organized. Um, for the most part, they're online. So you can check out Ludum Dare, spelled Ludum Dare. Um, you can check out the Global Game Jam, which is at the end of every January. Uh, itch.io and Game Jolt have pages dedicated to jams that are going on every day of every week. Mm. Those are smaller jams, but they're a great way for you to get the practice in before the bigger ones like Ludum Dare, like Global Game Jam, like something that might come up at a convention. Uh, and they're just a lot of fun. Sounds like yeah, fun. Sounds like a blast. It also sounds really, really stressful, though. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's stressful, but it's short-term stressful. Right. And at the end of it, you've made a game. And sometimes it's not all that stressful. I mean, if the team you've got together is just gelling and things are getting done, uh, then, it, then it's not stressful at all. It's just, like, a blast at that point. 
And before you know it, the 72 hours have run up um, and you've got between like one and five levels of a brand new game that nobody's ever played before and you're pulling off all kinds of weird mechanics and crazy physics that nobody's thought about um and it can lead to some amazing projects all right i'm sold <laughs> you sold me cool it honestly it sounds like the kind of stress that i enjoy <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it is it is definitely enjoyable stress. And, of course, depending on your situation, whether you're like, you know, ideally if you're doing a game jam uh, in the real world, then, you know, there's pizza and soda and all that other, like, catered goodness that goes along with it. You had me sold and then you mentioned food, man. <laughs> Isn't it funny how that happens? <laughs> okay, so you said all of your games are available on Steam, right? Yep. Okay, so what is the process of putting your games on Steam? And have you ever considered putting your games on sites like the eShop or the PlayStation Network? So, when it comes to putting your game on Steam, do not do as I did. Um, So back in 2012, I founded the Boston Festival of Indie Games, uh, which was hosted at MIT. We thought we would have 200 people. We had 2,000. Crammed into two classrooms. Oh it was my. scary. So the next year, we basically sent a pitch deck to Valve saying, hey, we would like you to be at this event um, if you wanted to throw a party the night before and get to know some of our local indies. This is the place to do it. They said yes. Um, so I showed the Valve guys some of the games we were working on. And... They looked at me and said, send this to me right now. So I rushed home from my own party (laughs) to send Valve a build. Uh, One month later, they said, we want to put this on Steam. Um, So I don't recommend everybody go out and literally start a convention just to get their game on Steam. Uh, I wouldn't have recommended then, and I really don't recommend it now, <laughs> because Steam has introduced uh, a platform called Steam Direct, where you pay Valve a hundred dollars and you can put your game on Steam. Wow, simple as that. Yeah, simple as that. So getting a game on Steam is no longer difficult. Getting a game on a console platform is a little more difficult. You need to send. Um, usually you have to send the console developer um, a full package on like what your game is about and then they have to approve it then you get what's known as a developer kit and sometimes you even have to pay for that yourself and they can be pretty expensive Wow! Uh, but you get a developer kit that um, you basically work in to port your game to that platform from PC uh, and you know you basically at that point kind of have to branch your game off into almost a completely separate game depending on the platform um that is why though i'm pretty happy about this latest generation and this upcoming generation of consoles basically just being pcs because it has made the porting process so much easier for every developer so they don't have to worry about recoding their game from the ground up just to get it working on every platform you know they have to optimize and there's some changes that they have to do but the overall process has been vastly simplified Um, so consumers may complain that with the hardware that's going into the platforms it's making them more expensive and less special but it makes developers lives a heck of a (laughs) lot easier which means the consumer gets more choice and choice is what's really, really important in the end, not the bells and whistles in the platform that make the developers' lives a living hell to get anything running. Right. That sounds about right. Because I know personally for me, Nintendo is hardware is usually behind the current generation. So a lot of, you know, especially I'm sure it's even worse for indie developers, but they don't want to put all that time and that effort and put it in port it over to a Nintendo uh, console because it's just going to take way too much time, way too much effort, and probably way too much money than they're willing to invest. Well, the nice thing about Nintendo uh, 
platforms is yeah they're they're weaker so if you have a super powerful game you're probably going to say okay maybe we shouldn't bring it to Nintendo however with the switch running um the on the uh, Nvidia Tigra platform what that's meant is that the technology is actually slightly more in line with regular PCs. Not as much, but slightly. It's a little bit different. But there also is a surprising amount of power inside it. Uh, you look at uh, how the, say, the Doom port came out, and yeah, it's not as graphically beautiful as its PC or Xbox One counterparts, um, but it works, and it runs, and it's, you know, nearly the exact same game uh, as you get on PC. Uh, so I think that that is kind of a testament to how much um, technology parity is helping make feature parity uh, across the industry, across all the different game launches. And so really what it comes down to is what kind of ecosystem uh, do I want to be a part of uh, less than, you know, what games in particular uh, do I want to get in on? You know, there are still exclusives, but there are fewer exclusives and fewer excuse for exclusives. So uh, something like the Switch is a little more interesting in that manner than Xbox One or PlayStation 4, which, you know, pretty much there, uh, you're looking at software differences. And by that, I mean the software that comes on the console, the, you know, the ecosystems that Microsoft and Sony have respectfully created. You know, stuff like, do I want PlayStation Now or do I want uh, Xbox Game Pass? Uh, so these are different things to think about in that sense versus with the Switch. It's like, okay, do I want a console that I can carry around with me, you know, and play on the bus mm. or the train or wherever? Um, so there is that. In a way, it's kind of become more like Windows versus Mac <laughs> than you know than Nintendo versus Sega right. used to be. Uh, so. Um, okay, so having said all of that, how do you feel about game streaming, and where do you think gaming is headed? I think game streaming is very young. It's an interesting prospect. I don't necessarily see it being a market changer in its current form I think it could be very useful say as a demo platform uh, demos have really fallen out of favor uh, in like the last couple decades you notice that there's kind of no way to try a game before you buy it anymore so what tends to happen is nowadays people will play their games vicariously uh, by watching Twitch or Mixer or YouTube. And in doing so, though, developers don't have quite as much to show for it versus, you know, when you could play a demo, people would be like, oh, hey, you know what? This plays well, and I like it. I'm going to go buy it. Um, you know, especially because I, you know, I'm only getting a chunk of it. On Twitch, you watch the whole game, and then go watch another game, and then go watch another game, and never buy it. So what I see game streaming potentially veering toward is, you know, we're seeing that full-fledged experiences are very difficult for them to handle, but I feel like they could handle demo experiences pretty well. Like, if, if you paid a uh, subscription fee, you know, say you know, five, five bucks a month or whatever it is. And then you get to try out every game on the market, you know, for like 20 minutes to, to get a feel for it. And then you can go buy it and not have to worry about latency issues or lag or disconnections or anything like that when you're trying it out. Um, that's the kind of thing that is a whole lot more consumer friendly I would say and developers can potentially benefit off of it you know so like you know you would have your free version which can have a few demos up every month or you know however you want to do the market so you know in in, in my head it's like you know you have the free version which you know maybe that's like 
five to ten rotating demos every month and then the paid version which gives you access to the entire library to check out and you know let's let's not bother with the 4k streaming i think 4k just hasn't you know hit the market the same way that 1080p did back in the day um 1080p is still pr- the pretty much the gold standard across the board right I haven't seen people throwing out their 1080p TVs the way they did their SD TVs. Right. And, like, in terms of 4K adoption numbers, they're still very, very low. So the idea that with our current infrastructure, you know, these these companies want to stream in 4K, I think it's just a little silly. Just get the, get the core of the technology down first, which they haven't done. Um, even at 720p, 1080p, there's still latency and lag issues. They still can't get new games onto the platforms. And, you know, we'll see where it goes this year. But in my mind, it's kind of bleak. I think there's a lot of room for improvement, especially with the Google Stadia right now. Um yeah, definitely. I think that's a pretty cool idea, what you said. It sounds like something you might not want to share on this podcast, Danny. Yeah, you know, people can have it. I don't have the budget to, you know, make everything happen in my life that I want to. You there know. you go, so, a free $10 like, million dollar idea. Basically, you know, as long as at, in the end somebody's like, yeah, you know, I heard this idea uh, on this specific podcast, <laughs> and and they give us thanks. And just give us a thumbs up and a nod and a wink. Uh, I'm good with that. And a little shout out. <laughs> little shout out, yeah. Little shout out to Bird Dog Gaming and Lantana Games. <laughs> That's all we need. Have you been gaming your entire life, Danny? I have indeed, yep. Um, I started gaming at around three. And then by five, I had decided I wanted to make games for a living. Wow. Yep. And here I am. What about, like, in high school? I mean, you never... What, what did your parents think of something like that? <laughs> um, They were into it. Wow. Uh, when I was, like, three or four months old, I uh, my parents had this typewriter. Um, they, lo- they love to tell this story. So my parents had this, like, one of the first electronic typewriters, like, computerized. And I ended up inputting um, a debug test code in it and it started printing endlessly just just a bunch of test gibberish and it wouldn't stop <laughs> so they called up the tech support and they're like yeah he inputted the debug code how the hell did he do that <laughs> oops you said he was how old <laughs> he's three months old what <laughs> so um And that skill kind of continues to this day. I'm pretty good at breaking games. Um, Even in college, like, you know, I would play my friends' games and I would break every single aspect of them before they handed them in. And I I was just a pain in the ass to everybody. Uh, So, yeah, I've been playing games since I was three. I've been wanting to make games since I was five. I've been actually making games uh, since I was like 10 or 11. And uh, in high school, oh, how many games did I make in high school? I think I made like three or four games across high school. And then, um, yeah, another like, well, you know, excluding projects, probably like another three, like three to six in college. Actually, no, including, pro- including projects, it was probably like six during college. Mm-hmm. And then post-college in the last decade um dozens so like everything from web games to steam games to stuff i've never released and could never finish stuff that like was just like you know personal projects that would break every copyright law known to man (laughs) that i never told anybody about (laughs) but it was just you know good prototype practice basically and just uh for the last few years though I've been pretty focused on just kind of doing one game at a time, and I want to get back to you know multi uh, multi launch years. So, uh, Mondrian Plastic Reality is coming out later this year, but I would love to 
get some new web or even mobile games uh, out there. Like really, really small, fun, just time killer kind of stuff. So did you go to school for coding? I went to school for interactive design and game development at the Savannah College of Art and Design between 2005 and 2009. That's awesome. Um, So I studied under Brenda Brathwaite, now Romero. Um, She uh, was uh, one of the key designers on the Wizardry and Jagged Alliance series back in the day. Okay. Uh, So she knew her stuff and still knows her stuff. And... So basically, when it comes to game design, I kind of have her to thank for being a little bit of a perfectionist and holding myself and our team to pretty rigorous standards when it comes to fun and playability and interesting mechanics as opposed to anything that's like purely derivative. I'm a big believer that no matter what you make, you can make it your own, even if you're just like, say, doing a tutorial or, you know, actually trying to clone a game just for practice. You can still make it your own. There's still, there's always something you can do differently. Um, so I, I have her to thank for that kind of influence. That's well put. I guess that kind of goes with your Mondrian game taking a, a simple breakout game and doing something totally different with it oh yeah that game is it has become a monster of unimaginable proportion compared to at least compared to the first one and definitely compared to nearly every other breakout game on the market <laughs> and I'm not afraid to say that I will I will stand by that statement you go ahead and show me your you go ahead and show me your ball and paddle game and, and show me why it's better than Mondrian, and I'll just go ahead and laugh and outdo you. <laughs> so here's something I was really excited to ask you about on this episode. I've been waiting like a month for us to get this get together and make this happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm finishing up my college degree right now and ma- majoring in mechanical engineering. I have two semesters left. Um, I have an internship, actually, with coding, so... It's a language called Lisp that no one's ever heard of, unfortunately. But I'm still learning coding. I'm learning about the conditionals, the ifs and ands, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I'm pretty passionate about gaming and the gaming industry. I'm not so passionate about engineering. Hmm. What kind of advice would you offer someone like me where it's too late to go back and spend another 50 grand on college tuition to go learn coding? Um yeah, what kind of advice would you offer somebody like me? Well, so first of all, there are um, some aspects of game development that do involve physical engineering. You know, you can always see what jobs are open at companies like EVGA or Antec or Cooler Master or whoever. Um, in the meantime, if you want to like start diving into actual game development... Um, you can find all kinds of courses on YouTube or Udemy or Teachable and just dive into, you know, whatever free engine you can download, whether it's Unity, Unreal, Click Team Fusion, Game Maker, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and really just get going on making games. You know, uh, a decade and a half ago when I started school, there just were not the resources available that there are today. And if there had been, I probably would not have gone to school for game development. (laughs) I probably would have just done online courses, saved at least $75,000, and made a whole lot more games in the process. I would have discovered the local community up here because I discovered that without my school... Um, at the time it it was like, uh, my sophomore year of college, I was like, I should find out what other game, uh, what other game developers are, you know, in the Boston area. So I did a search and I found the Boston postmortem community. I never heard of it before. Um, and I think I was home on uh, Thanksgiving through Christmas break. And I noticed that the next meetup was like the next day. So I said, okay, cool. I'll go to that. 
And so I went to it, and I instantly recognized uh, one guy, Darius Kazemi, who had given a talk down at SCAD and uh, immediately befriended him, had no idea that like he was from up here, uh, at least at the time, and made a whole bunch of friends there and kept going to that, um, got involved with the uh, startup Boston Indies community when that started uh, around graduation. And a few years later, founded Boston Fig. So, like, uh, I forget where I'm going with this tangent. (laughs) But basically, you know, a lot of it comes down to not what you can do, but who you know. So, you know, learn some game development and do some networking is really what it comes down to. Yeah, that's some good advice. I've heard of Udemy courses, and um, I think you can get some things on your resume from doing those too. Like those are pretty good. That's yep. a pretty good source. Yeah, there's a lot of really, really good sources out there. There's tons of YouTube channels and Discord communities that are devoted to uh, learning game development, learning specific game engines, uh, meeting other game developers. There's no shortage of resources at this point. So definitely save your money on going back to school. Um, Your degree in mechanical engineering will not be completely useless. Um, And working for, you know, one of the hardware companies, not a terrible way of getting your foot in the door with the game industry either. So that's an option. Uh, I don't think you're completely screwed. There's definitely, you know, plenty to learn on the software side for you. But I think you're in a pretty good position overall. That makes me feel good. <laughs> Talk to me about the upcoming game, Mondrian Plastic Reality. I'm ready to hear all about it. All right. So Mondrian Plastic Reality is a time-tripping, block-breaking adventure through art history. You play as uh, Pete Mondrian and... Uh, four of his other curator friends as you uncover their lost modernist masterpieces. So in Mondrian Plastic Reality, your goal, like in most brick-breaking games, is to break all the blocks in a level. There's, you know, there's there's kinds of blocks that you don't have to break in order to beat a level, but uh, anything that uh, gets, like, painted, those are the ones you have to break. Now, what Mondrian does differently from other Brick Breakers is we have a combination of the level editor, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Mondrian Maker, and the game does many deep layers of dynamic generation. So we've taken some inspiration from roguelite games, uh, and, you know, so there are some some very, uh, like, rudimentary... Uh, roguelite systems in there that give uh, the game its kind of unique flavor a little bit. So, for instance, um, power-ups will always be in different locations. Uh, The game will randomly determine what panel you've got, what ball you've got, your wall shape, whether the wall rotates and in what direction and at what speed. The game will randomly choose a background and a music and Once all these factors multiply together, and it is multiplication, as well as the fact that each level can have four variations, one for each difficulty, there are literally an infinite number of levels possible in this game. We have absolutely outdone the Mario Plex. (laughs) Um, And if you you get that reference, it's just a theory, a game theory. (laughs) So... What we've created here is almost like if you could play graphic design a little bit. Um, Mondrian Maker takes a big inspiration from Photoshop uh, of all uh, of of all tools imaginable. It, it's like if if you were to combine Photoshop and uh, and Mario Maker into one thing, you would get Mondrian Maker. What a description. (laughs) Yep. Uh, So you can make everything from a very basic layout, just like a square of squares or a hexagon of hexagons, uh, or, you know, even just levels with like one or two blocks, if you want to, all the way up to the Mona Lisa. This tool set is 
kind of insane. Uh, we have painting tools in there so you can paint your blocks uh, specific colors and and go all out with your creativity. Or if they're unpainted, the game will auto-generate uh, color schemes that all look beautiful together based on a back-end color wheel uh, that it then selects, uh, you know, monochrome, adjacent, triad, uh, or tetrad color schemes to go along with it with or without opposite colors. You know, the original Mondrian Abstraction in Beauty, um, I calculated that it had like 48 million possible levels just between 12 level layouts and and all the dynamic generation we did in that. 48 million was pretty good. This is literally infinite. 48 million was not enough. (laughs) No, it was not. It wasn't enough for me. So... You know, like I said earlier, we're trying to get a big creator community together uh, to uh, build content and support each other. Uh, we will be open to patronage on an 80-20 split in creator's favor. Um, and the game is also open to um, some levels of modding as well. Um, unfortunately, the engine can't really pull in external code. But we're making sure that, like, a lot of the elements of the game can be modded, in particular background images and some other images as well. So we do ship the game with some graphics templates. Uh, So if you're, you know, more of a traditional artist and you want to, like, make background artwork for it, you can just open that up and uh, save out uh, the, um, the sliced images. Uh, for the background and Photoshop will you know put it together for you and you literally just drop the folder into uh, the game's app data folder and boom it's modded just like that wow. um, just like that yeah one thing I noticed about you know modding traditionally is it can be very scary to install a mod you know you have to put the files in the right places and sometimes you even have to overwrite files and you know, so then you have to make backups of the original files in case it doesn't work. I wanted to make a frictionless modding experience for Mondrian. Um, so there are going to be functions in the game that will like help you restore default settings no matter what. And in terms of dropping in content, literally you just have to import stuff into the right folders or import uh, just a folder entirely and no matter what the game will say okay cool this is a level uh there's a new level this is you know background images okay i can i can load that background so you know over time i'm hoping that we can open up to more like programmatic modding uh but at the very least at launch uh there is going to be image based modding at the very least as well as the level editor now, Pete Mondrian is not just a made-up character. No, he is not. Um, Pete Mondrian was one of the founders of the Distyle movement, uh, also known as neoplasticism. And uh, you're probably familiar with it from uh, the color block style. So if you know like composition in red, blue, and yellow, for instance, where it's just like big squares and rectangles of colors, uh, that was Mondrian. The goal for that art style was to kind of um, get down to the root of art, uh, you know, primary colors and simple shapes. And so the the inspiration there uh, into the game itself is, yeah, first of all, um, we do have a distyle color scheme in the game, but naming the game after Pete Mondrian was really more a matter of, well, you know, it's a... At, at its core, it is a core video game. It is, you know, one of the first genres of video games ever created. The gameplay itself is core, very simple, very addictive. It's a very easy loop to get into and understand. And and so the, the inspiration from Pete Mondrian himself is kind of multi-tiered uh, in the game. And as well, you know, with the upcoming adventure mode, uh, we will be exploring, uh, you know, at least like the first part of his life story as uh, you work to uncover 
uh, some of his lost masterpieces. And over time, we will be releasing the other character stories as well. Uh, so, you know, what with um, launch coming up in, you know, later this year, uh, the plan right now is we will be doing uh, monthly what we're calling gallery openings. Um, so the hub world of the game is this, like, big art museum. And this art museum is also customizable. So there are uh, art packs that uh, you'll be able to get for free during the gallery opening event and for cheap afterward. Um, and uh, when you get these packs, you can place them on top of pedestals and decorate your museum however you want. Uh, but within the museum, there are also these paintings that, you know, kind of like Mario 64, you jump into, and um, that represents, like, a level or the story uh, that you're going to go play, where you go back in time and explore the characters' lives. So, at launch, um, uh, the two, like, adventure modes that we're going to be having in there are the tutorial and Pete's story, and then... Um, we'll be releasing a uh, core story for the game every other month in between slightly more fun gallery openings. And uh, we're going to be using these to not just celebrate uh, the life stories of our playable characters, which also include uh, Sophie Tavararp, the mother of Dada, um, Hale Woodruff, a um, heritage uh, impressionist painter from Atlanta, uh, Andy Warhol. I mean, if you don't know the father of pop art, <laughs> what what kind of rock are you living under? Uh, and Lois Melu Jones, uh, a local uh, impressionist artist who lived on Martha's Vineyard her whole life and had a very interesting uh, experience trying to get her works into the MFA, the Museum of Fine Arts up here in Boston, uh, who would not accept works from african-american women at the time but you know her story is actually really interesting and kind of funny so uh i'm i'm really looking forward to getting that one into the game uh so in between those stories like i said we're gonna be doing events that are um more catered toward like holidays and um celebrating our creator community and even other indie games uh so Keep an eye out uh, for those post-launch. Um, and, you know, we don't want to make these, you know, like like your regular live ops events that are just kind of cold and uh, corporate. We want to make sure that these are, like, parties that everybody can get in on them. Um, that when you get in on the uh, the gallery opening during the week all the content that's associated with it will be free if you happen to be late to the party that's when you'll you know kind of pay for a, a ticket to like get the you know to, to get the party later on um, right right so you know like, you know this is a business you know we gotta do what we gotta do um, but I personally think that that is a fair setup. Um, and so really what it comes down to is, you know, this is the kind of game that you can pick up for five minutes, ten minutes a day, never get tired of it. And even on the first game, we had players who put in two or three hundred hours. Wow. I think maybe four hundred in one case. <laughs> and that was with just 12 levels built into the game. Um, now we're up to more than 90 that we've built ourselves. And we can only imagine what's going to come out uh, of the community uh, at least once we launch. So, yeah, there's never going to be any kind of shortage of things to do inside this game, whether you're playing or making or exploring content or uh, adventuring through stories or writing your own stories or modding or, or anything else. Like, it is almost an activity center more than a game um but yet it is a game there is you know a core very addictive and unpredictable gameplay loop to it that 
keeps me playing it every day, that keeps other team members playing it every day, that, you know, even back in the first one, kept the community playing it every day. Um, and, you know, we want to see them adopt it and get in. And we want to give them reasons to come back every single month with new gameplay additions, new, you know, aesthetics, new tools, new music, new characters, new everything. Um, and I think that uh, the live ops model is a good way to do that without also forcing players to really buy anything else as long as they're having fun. This game is so much more than a breakout game from what I've seen. That goes for both Mondrians. Yep. This game sounds really, really, really exciting, and I and I am anxious to play it. Do we have a release date or, like, a release month or...? Um, so the goal right now is... I'm just going to say it. God damn it. I'm just going <laughs> to say it because it all comes down to me. <laughs> September 22nd, 2020. All right. Um, you heard it here first. Literally the fifth year anniversary of the launch of Abstraction and Beauty. Oh, that's awesome. So my thinking there was why not? Um, so here's what's going to happen at launch. If you own Montreal Abstraction and Beauty, you'll be able to get in on a series bundle and that series bundle will give you 30% off the cost of the game so we are releasing the game for $15 and with the 30% off you'll essentially get it for 10 so in other words if you don't have the first Mondrian you need to go pick it up immediately yep and get yourself that discount on September 22nd we're hoping yep luckily this podcast is on the youtube aggregator so we can show some gameplay for those of you who are thinking that it's just a brick breaker it's not it's an awesome game it looks so awesome i'm excited for the release on september 22nd oh yeah no it's um it, it's gonna come out on september 22nd one way or another i mean at this point there is a fully playable game in there even if like the story mode isn't in and there's some Mondrian maker features that we want to finish up. Um, but at this point, if we launched it, we would be proud of what we launched. Uh, a lot of people have said it, it is available in early access, uh, on itch.io game jolt cartridge and discord. Uh, you can join our discord community, uh, if you uh, want to pick it up there. Uh, and and like talk about the game and share your creations, but uh, a lot of people have who've tested it and played it have been like, this is in early access. This is one of the smoothest, best playing early access experiences we've ever tried. Well, that is awesome feedback. Yep, it's exciting. Hannah, you got any more questions for Danny? Um, no, I think you pretty much covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Danny, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I have learned a lot about indie game development, and honestly, whether you were trying to instill this in me or not, I have gained a great appreciation for what indie game developers do behind the scenes and what you guys have to go through. Um, where can the people find you? Uh, so the people can find everything they need about Lantana Games at lantanagames.com. Uh, you can follow us on just about all the social medias at Lantana Games. Uh, you can join our Discord server to talk Mondrian and art and pick up a copy of the game in early access. Otherwise, uh, yeah, just like follow us, buy a game, buy a t-shirt, uh, support us on uh, Ko-Fi or Coffee. I don't know what it's called, but it's basically <laughs> uh, our, our Patreon. Um, and you don't have to uh, subscribe to it monthly. You can just do, you know, a one-time donation. Um, any support uh, really helps us because we are unfunded. Um, no angels, no VCs, really not even much in the way of friends and family investment. You know, we are supported by our fans. Uh, we're supported by gamers. We're supported by the community. We are you guys. You know, like I said, I've been playing games my whole life. Um, you know, starting with like SimCity and Golden Axe back in the day, all the way up to GTA V. Um, so, you know, I am one of you. I am a founder of the PC Master Race. 
Um, and yeah, like, you know, like, like I said, we, we survived because of you guys, you know, we've been around for 10 years because of you guys, um, barely scraped by that whole time. Uh, but we are scraping by and we're, we're hoping to bring, uh, just a fantastic game with Mondrian plastic reality later this year. Really looking forward to that game releasing. Danny, thanks again for coming on the show, man. Support your indies. Yes, support your indies, and thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much. All right, that was a pretty awesome podcast. What do you think, Hannah? That was a very awesome podcast. Thank you, uh, Danny, for talking to us. I think the main point that we should take away from this whole podcast is to support your indie developers. They really do need it. They're not AAA companies getting money from you know where. They thrive off of your support. As corny as that was, I agree with Hannah. We definitely need to be supporting. I mean, I seriously learned a lot from this guy. Um, I had no idea that they were on such a, like an Apple Music level of how much they get paid. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea either. But yeah, definitely earned my respect. And Lantana Games is pretty awesome. That game looks awesome, and I'm definitely going to be checking it out. I mean, he says the game is basically infinite, so you can play it forever and never never have the same level twice that sounds awesome hannah where can the people find you they can find me at game real advance sp on instagram i am at that gamer nerd on instagram showing off my collection a few times a week and you can follow bird dog gaming everywhere else we will see you guys next time on the unlockable podcast see ya.